don't just acknowledge him, we behold him this morning. We behold his beauty, we behold who he is. And he's consistent through all the ages. He's consistent in everything he says and he does. He's true to his word. He's true to his name, Yahweh. You are true to your name, Yahweh. You are true to your name, Yahweh. And we continue to lift up your name, Jesus. We continue to lift up your name, Jesus. Adonai,
There's no one like you You are holy You are holy You are holy Holy forever Worthy
just lift up your voice and begin to cry out to the Lamb of God. Just begin to lift up your voice now. Just begin to sing your own song. Pray and call on the name of Jesus, the Lamb of God. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. We glorify you, O oh God. We lift you up in this house. You alone get all glory and praise. We worship you, King Jesus. Holy is the Lamb of God. Holy is the King of Kings. Holy is the Lord of Lords. We will lift you up and we will praise your name. We will shout your praises. We will give you all glory. You are Yahweh. Hallelujah to the Lamb. Hallelujah to our Savior. Hallelujah to the Messiah. Hallelujah to King Jesus. Oh, we glorify you. We worship you this hour. We give you all praise. You alone give the highest praise in the house of the Lord. We worship you. experiencing the presence of God there's no other way for me to really put it and when we show up he meets us every time we don't have to complicate the experience that we have here when we come in on Sundays we don't we come just as we are and the Holy Spirit meets us. Because you're loved with an everlasting love. Don't really think about it. This kind of love, it, it doesn't run out. And it won't run out on you. Steadfast. 
lives. Rest in that love today. You may be seated. Thank you, worship team. Thank you, musicians. Praise God. Thank you, Yomi. Welcome, everyone. Welcome, Yomi. While Gary and Tia are on mission right now for a couple of weeks, um, the Lord has blessed us with our brother Yomi, and um, we're grateful for what the Lord is able to do when we come and we gather together and we worship King Jesus. Man, isn't the presence of God good? Oh, man. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Turn to somebody and tell them, I'm glad you're here. Turn to them one more time and tell them, let's get into the word. Praise God. Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2. Our text today is in Genesis chapter 2. Message is titled, Let Go and Trust God. Give somebody a smile and tell them, Let go and trust God. Exodus chapter 2. I'm sorry. I don't know why I said, I said Genesis. Exodus chapter 2. Exodus chapter 2. Exodus chapter 2. Exodus chapter 2, and just to give you a little context as you turn, Jacob's family in Exodus chapter 1 had come to dwell in Egypt because the extensive famine they faced in their land. And it was a famine that caused them to have to move and settle in Egypt. It was a family of 70 that made the move and then they multiplied. Scripture says that the land was filled with them. God was fulfilling his promise that he gave to Abraham, that he would have many sons from generation to generation. Listen, after Joseph, who was in Egypt, died, a new king rose up and this king did not care about the history and the impact that Joseph had in Egypt. And as he saw the Israelite people multiplying, he developed a plan of action to enslave the Israelites, but the people of God continued to multiply, amen. So Pharaoh told the Hebrew midwives to kill any son that the Hebrew women delivered. But the midwives feared God more than Pharaoh and did not do what they were told to do, but rather protect the babies that were born then Pharaoh became very upset and continued to pursue newborn baby boys. And this is a story of God's protection in Exodus chapter 2. This is a story of God's intervention, God's providence, and the fulfillment of God's divine purpose through faith. Exodus chapter 2, beginning with, with verse 1, you got it, say amen. Now a man from the house of Levi went and took as his wife a Levite woman. Now let me just say right here, Moses is born into the tribe of Levi. This is a priestly tribe. Moses is a type of Christ who is our great high priest. In verse 2, the woman conceived and bore a son. And when she saw that he was a fine child, everyone say a fine child. She hid him three months. Now listen, this was not an oh, my baby is cute and fine kind of observation, like some of us do when we have our newborn and it don't matter how wrinkled up their face is. We just absolutely believe without a doubt, my baby is beautiful. But the text actually really means that she believed from the moment that she laid eyes on her child that he was special, called, and set apart for a great purpose. This mother recognized a touch of God on his life immediately. And this mother was not going to allow the fear of man to get in the way of her child's future. Hebrews 11 verse 23 
says, by faith, Moses, when he was born, was hidden for three months by his parents because they saw that the child was beautiful and they were not afraid of the king's edict. Church, the world says that whoever controls the narrative has the power. But as believers, you must know in faith that when we live our lives in obedience to God's narrative, we have access to the power of his spirit. The church must be devoted to God above any other ruler, government, nation, or any circumstance. Amen. We must not allow man's laws and opinions to alter the language and the narrative of our church. We will not be intimidated by scare tactics and threats that come from the pit of hell. We serve a holy and mighty God who is to be revered and worshipped in spirit and in truth. Now look at Exodus 2 verse 3. You with me? Say amen. amen. When she could hide him no longer, mama took for him a basket made of bulrushes and daubed it with bitumen and pitch. She put the child in it and placed it among the reeds by the riverbank. Man, it's going to be really important. All of you stick with me. Imagine what it would be like to release your three-month-old baby, not knowing what would happen to him or where he will end up. After you've given birth, you nursed your baby, you held that baby close, you stayed up all night trying to ease his crying, you rocked him to sleep, and then you have to give him up. Imagine the emotions, the feelings, Moses' mother, her name is Jochebed. She places him in the water and gently pushes his little boat down the river. Imagine being this mother as she left him alone in the water, trusting God's mighty hand to guide and protect him. The child she gave birth to must now be released. Miriam, the younger sister, is watching from a distance. But the mother had to let go. Church, she didn't just let him go. This mother let go and trusted her God. Hey, th this is an act of faith. Believing for God's protection and deliverance. Moses' mother, Jochebed, placed him in the basket to protect him from Pharaoh's decree to kill all Hebrew male babies. It wasn't neglect. It demonstrates a desperate act of faith to believe that God would protect his life. You see, the act of placing him in the Nile River was a desperate attempt to save his life. Not reckless. Not reckless. But desperate and bold. How do we know that it wasn't a reckless act? Well, because there was preparation in verse 3. That tells us that Moses' mother prepared. She created a little basket boat, also referred to as a boat that she made out of papyrus plants. Waterproofed it. She waterproofed it with tar and placed the child in it. Could you imagine? Then she set it afloat in the reeds at the edge of the Nile. Not in the deepest part of the Nile, but at the edge of the Nile. For in the deepest part of the Nile, there would be crocodiles and alligators and snakes. She knew what she was doing. She was intentional. Hey, church, a desperate reaction without preparation is dangerous. Desperation that comes with preparation, planning, and prayer is the way of God's protection. It says it in Proverbs 21, 5. The plans of the diligent lead to profit as surely as haste leads to poverty. Meaning simply this. You can be desperate, but don't rush into things without preparing properly. You can, there can, I believe that God has called us to be a church moving with a desperation, but we can't just rush into anything. We've got to plan. We've got to pray. We've got to seek God. We've got to understand what it is his will for us. Desperation without preparation is a rush job that can often end up leaving us broke and empty. Church, Proverbs 16.3 says, commit to the Lord 
whatever you do. And he will establish your plans. You ever thought that maybe God wants to be involved in every aspect of your life? Commit it to the Lord, whatever you do, and he will establish your plans. He doesn't mind our plans. He just wants to be involved in them. Some of us dismiss the importance of allowing God to really govern every aspect of our lives. Okay, Exodus 2, verse 4, and his sister stood at a distance. That's Miriam. She stands at a distance to know what would be done to him. In verse 5, you with me? Say amen. Amen. Now the daughter of Pharaoh came down to bathe at the river while her young women walked beside the river. She saw the basket among the reeds and sent her servant woman and she took it. In verse 6, when she opened it, she saw the child. And behold, everyone say behold. Turn to one other person, tell them behold. The baby was crying. Scripture says she took pity. In other words, she had compassion for him. This is, she says, this is one of the Hebrews' children. Hey, when the writer in Scripture uses the word behold, it means pay attention to what follows. Behold, the baby was crying. As the baby's going down the Nile River, the baby is crying. But it's God's divine intervention and God's divine protection that allows this baby to move down the river while crying. And the only one who responds to the cry and the only one who even sees the little boat is Pharaoh's daughter. Not the Egyptian soldiers, not the Egyptian politicians. No one else along the river saw the boat except for Miriam and Pharaoh's daughter. Wow. Church, that's God's divine intervention. Let me tell you something. Every sequence surrounding Moses' unbelievable survival in the river is an act of God's divine intervention. It demonstrates God's sovereignty, God's providence. God's providence being his grace and his supernatural work to move us through any unlikely circumstances to fulfill his purpose in our lives. Imagine if we truly understood that we live under the umbrella of God's providence. Meaning, he's got everything under control. Regardless of the circumstances, whether they look good or not, don't forget that there's a good God who is able to make a way out of no way. That's God's divine providence. It's real. It's real. And it's active each and every day of our lives. Verse 7, then his sister said to Pharaoh's daughter, shall I go and call you a nurse from the Hebrew woman to nurse the child for you? I love this. I don't know why. It's hard for me to picture the little girl 2,000 years ago. I kind of picture the girl within the urban context of New York City like, you want me to go get a nurse for you? I got you. you I mean, I've been right here all this time, but... And Pharaoh's daughter says to her, well, all right, go. So the girl went and called the child's mother. Let me tell you something. Little sister took a risk. She took a risk. Here's why. Understand this. Opening up her mouth to suggest to Pharaoh's daughter a direction to take was risky. Little sister would be considered a slave girl, unimportant and unqualified to speak in the presence of royalty. Hey, church, don't be afraid to speak up. Don't let fear keep you silent when you shouldn't be. God desires to raise up your voice as a testimony. You're not too young and you're not too old. The Holy Spirit can work in the lives of children, in the lives of teenagers, young adults, young and old. We've been called to be a voice. And sometimes we find ourselves pulling back when we should be moving forward. He desires to raise up your voice as a testimony. Listen, not when you have enough followers, not when you have enough of a fan base, not when you finally come into a, a, a place of title or position. You, you, you don't wait for that. But because you are a child of God, an image bearer of Christ, you've been given power and authority by his spirit at work in you. Speak up and take a risk in faith. Not by might, nor by your own power, but by his spirit at work in you. Maybe, 
Maybe, just maybe the thought, the idea, the dream, the goal, that which has been sitting in your heart for so long has not come to pass because you haven't spoken up about it yet. Philippians 2.13 For it is God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Remember, God at work in you, God, his spirit at work in you is able to propel you and move you forward into things that you thought you could never do in your own strength. And you're right about that. You can't do these things in your own strength. Little Miriam should have never stepped up like that. Remember, her role was to simply watch from a distance. But God at work in her gave her a revelation that this is an opportunity for me to be able to be used by God to move God's purposes forward. Remember, she just watched from a distance, but there's always more when you yield to the power of the Holy Spirit at work in you. Pharaoh's daughter said to her, take this child in verse 9. Pharaoh's daughter said, all right, take, take the child away and nurse him for me, and I will give you your wages. So the woman took the child and nursed him. The woman in verse 9 is not Miriam. The woman is Mama. Jochebed. Hey, church, what the enemy intended for evil, God is able to turn it around for his glory. But you first have to let go and trust God. One moment, the baby was under the threat of death. But God turned it around and now his mother was being paid by Pharaoh's daughter to raise him. That's called blessings on blessings. Miracle upon miracle. When you let go and you trust God. God will work it out. When there seems like there's no way out of a terrible situation, God will make a way. God spoke to the prophet Isaiah in 43, in chapter 43, verse 2 to 3. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. Come on, somebody read it. And through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through fire, you shall not be burned and the flame shall not consume you. Verse 3, for I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. I give Egypt as your ransom, Cush and Seba in exchange for you. Egypt can't hold nothing against you. But you've got to let go and trust God. Church, if God be for you, who? Who can be against you? You see, God's kingdom purpose will prevail as you persevere in faith. God's kingdom purpose, listen to me, will prevail as you persevere in faith and trust that the Holy Spirit, ready, has everything timed right. Everything is timed right by the Holy Spirit. So trust God. Look at verse 10. When the child grew older, she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter and he became her son. Whoa. Wait, you mean to tell me she had to let go a second time? Yes. But when you trust God, it doesn't matter how many times you have to release what's yours. You know that God will show up, meet the need, provide, save, and deliver, and God will have his way in his perfect timing. Imagine if she said, no, 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 I got him back. This, this, this is it. This is my miracle. This is my blessing. I'm not letting go. Hey, church, she needed to let go of her son a second time in order for us to be here today to gather. And remember, Moses is a type of Christ. Verse 10, look, she named him. Who named him? Pharaoh's daughter named the baby. Some of us, we struggling with that part right there. I did. Wait, what? That, that, that ain't even her baby. Jochebed gave birth to the baby. Why? Why? I don't, I don't understand. Well, because, see, when we lay down our lives and submit to the will of God, the unusual, the unexpected, 
can often be clearly a part of God's timing and plan and purpose. The very thing that just doesn't even look right. The very thing that sometimes feels unfair is very much a part of God's plan. If you yield to his will and walk in accordance to his word. She named him Moses because she said, I drew him out of the water. This this Pharaoh's daughter, she worships pagan gods. Like, who are you to give the name? At least so it seems naturally for us. We often feel very protected over those things that we feel like we've birthed, those things that we have a vision for, those things that we've been called to do. And all of a sudden, here is a name given to what she has birthed that comes from a woman who doesn't even know the God that we serve. But don't you know, regardless of who believes or who doesn't, God is always in control. This is God's plan for Moses. That he would be named Moses. That he would be raised up in the house of Pharaoh. Ultimately in the house of the very one who opposed the will of God. Moses has an upbringing that can only be described in the words of the psalmist. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. You better believe his cup overflowed. But it was far more than, uh, than a verse that expresses material things. The cup overflows. That's talking about the living water, the power of the Holy Spirit at work in us. But really, really, Moses was living out this verse literally. Some of you may be trying to create distance between You and your enemies. But God might be preparing a table for you in the presence of your enemies. Simply so that you would be a testimony of God's faithfulness. A testimony of God's providence. And a light in the darkest of places. So maybe, maybe, maybe you shouldn't be trying to create distance. Maybe you need to go ahead and prepare the table. And trust and believe that God will give you the grace and the wisdom to navigate those spaces where you know all around you, they hate you. We don't get the details of Moses growing up in Egypt. Matter of fact, it's a quick jump from Exodus 2 verse 10. And she names him Moses and takes the baby. And then verse 11, and then when Moses was all grown up. But I don't believe that God was interested in giving us the details of Egypt. I believe that God clearly wanted to give us the details of the power of his hand to deliver. We don't get the details, but neither did we get the details of Jesus growing up in Egypt. So if we don't get the details of Jesus growing up in Egypt, then we definitely don't need the details of Moses growing up in Egypt, especially if Moses is a type of Christ. But what we do know about Moses is that from infancy, listen, from infancy all the way to the parting of the Red Sea, Divine providence keeps him above water to fulfill God's promise to give us a savior. I believe if we truly understand God's divine providence, we would boldly let go of what we attempt to control in our own strength. Hey, I'm speaking to myself here. Sometimes we hold on too tightly to things that need to be released into the hands of God. Some of us can be so emotionally attached to things that we miss God's sovereignty and we forsake the leading of the Holy Spirit. We find ourselves consumed with the questions of regret and the feelings of discouragement that can bombard you to the point of defeat. Did I do enough? Maybe I shouldn't. Maybe I should have held out another three months and tried to figure something else out on my own. Did I make a wrong decision by letting go? Did I really hear from God? Am I a bad parent? Am I a bad mother? Am I a failure? I mean, this is the, this is the emotional tension that we can all relate to when we come to a place in life that requires us to let go and trust God. 
There comes a time, church, for all of us when you and I have to release someone or something very precious to you. Listen, the Holy Spirit gave me this this week. Letting go is not easy and rarely are we ready to let go. Especially when we have no control over what's next. And we struggle to navigate harsh circumstances that we can do nothing about. The reality is, you'll never really let go until you learn to trust God. This story in scripture spoke deeply to me. To me. This word begins first with me. I've been sitting on this for the last five days. Realizing that there comes a time where even I had to let go of what I birth in order to be nurtured by another and ultimately by God. And I had to do this. I had to let go and trust God as a necessary process of entrusting something that you've created, David Ham, something that you cultivated. I now have to let it go and entrust someone else to care and to guide it. It involves faith in God to do what only God can do. Ready? Humbly acknowledging that there will be others who are called to contribute to the growth and the development in ways you may not be able to provide. Me. I'm preaching to myself. David Ham, you have to humble yourself and, and acknowledge here at Soul Cry Church that there will be others that the Lord is going to bring in to his house. And they are going to be called and anointed and set apart for such a time as this to contribute to the growth and development in ways you may not be able to provide. And you will have to step back. And you will have to trust others. And you will have to believe in faith that God is ordering the steps of every believer that comes into the house of the Lord and contributes to the work and to the building of God's ministry and his kingdom and his church. And he alone gets the glory. He alone. It can only be the leading of the Holy Spirit for Jochebed to push her son down the Nile River. It didn't make sense to put Moses in those waters, church. Why? Hey, that's where Pharaoh was drowning babies. When the midwives didn't do what they were supposed to do, listen to me. When the midwives didn't do what they were supposed to do, Pharaoh took it upon himself with all of his Egyptian politicians and leaders and soldiers to begin to identify and find out where little baby boys were in the, amongst the people of Israel and they were drowning them in the Nile River. And yet, yet, that's where God leads Jochebed to let go and trust him? Naturally, you'd want to get as far away as you could from that river. But the Holy Spirit will lead us into the very places that we fear the most. So that he alone will get the glory. When we rise above the waters of darkness and destruction. God alone gets the glory when you are rescued out of the waters of Egypt. Yomi, could you come up here please and close and get on the keys. Hey church. You know, the name Jochebed is of Hebrew origin. It means Yahweh is glory. Jochebed. Mama's name means Yahweh is glory. Yahweh is to be praised. Yahweh is honored. I let go and I trust Yahweh. I let go 
and I trust the leading of the Holy Spirit. This is not the river I envisioned or imagined that I would push what I have birthed down the waters. But Yahweh will be glorified with everything that I have birthed, with everything that I have held closely. Yahweh gets the glory. You see, you and I will never release and trust God with what you have birthed without fully knowing in faith that Yahweh gets the glory. Hey, we're not done with the name dropping. Pharaoh's daughter, you know that girl that worshiped idols? The one who named the baby Moses? Remember we talked about that earlier? Can I get an amen? Amen. Well, as I was reading through commentary, one commentary, one commentator writes that in Hebrew, the name actually sounds like the verb masha, which means to draw out. The name also in some way is related to the common Egyptian word for son. Pharaoh's daughter knows that he's a Hebrew child. And you would have thought maybe that out of respect to her father, she would not take the Hebrew boy into the house. But God's divine intervention and God's protection can change the heart of anyone. He can change the heart of anyone. She names him Moses, Masha, which means to draw out related to the common Egyptian word son. Pharaoh's daughter knows he's a Hebrew child. It's possible here that she chose the name for its Hebrew and Egyptian senses. Her actions reveal God's providence. You ready? And it foreshadows Christ Jesus who rescues us out of Egypt. You see, this is all a part of the means that God uses to draw us out of bondage, to draw us out of sin. That from the very beginning, even when we read in Exodus 2, it is a picture of King Jesus who desires to rescue you and I out of the waters of darkness, out of the waters of death. This is a beautiful picture that we see. This all centers around Christ Jesus. The prophet Hosea wrote in chapter 11 and verse 1 in Hosea. When Israel was a child, I loved him. And out of Egypt, I called my son. When Israel was a child, I loved him. And out of Egypt, I called my son. You know what that says to me in verse 11, verse 1 of Hosea chapter 11? God is sovereign. God is faithful. God is the author and the finisher of our faith. God knows what he's doing. Actually, it wasn't Pharaoh's daughter that named the baby. It was God. A name that was given to him that means out of the waters, out of the dark place, I call my son. It is a picture of Christ who calls us out of darkness and calls us into his marvelous light. And if you're not convinced still, let me go back to Psalm chapter 18, verse 16 through 19. Hallelujah. And I close with this. He sent from on high. He took me. And look at that. This is the word of the Lord. He drew me out of many waters. He drew me out of many waters. He rescued me from my strong enemy and from those who hated me. For they were too mighty for me. Some of you are trying to fight a fight that you shouldn't be fighting. I'm telling you in the name of Jesus, let God do the fighting for you. Let go. Let go. You've been balling up your fists. You're angry and you're bitter. Let go and trust God. You're angry because certain things have worked out in a way that just seems unfair. Let go and trust God. He's going to keep you above water. He's going to fight the many enemies. 
They confronted me in the day of my calamity, verse 18. They confronted me. They got in my way. They, they, they ran up on me. They confronted me in the day of my calamity, the psalmist says. But the Lord was my support. He brought me out into a broad place. He rescued me because he delighted in me. Our God desires today to rescue you and bring you into a broad place, bring you into an open place. God desires to expand your territory. That's what that says. I'm just, I'm just, just helping you understand the word. He desires. He desires to see his people take flight and rise above waters. God's not worried about what's underneath. He desires to keep you afloat from infancy all the way to the Red Sea. You will rise above water. I had a moment last night. I think, Tyra, you were there. Zion was there. But actually, it happened a little early. I'm not even sure if it was Zoe or Zaina, but anyway, they'll know what I'm talking about. But over the last couple of weeks, <clears throat> You know, I, I've been having this disturbance on my deck in the backyard. There's been a mother robin who nested. She nested right under my deck, Pastor Danny, right under the deck, like just about midway under the deck. Now, if, let me tell you something. My deck is my prayer closet. I like, I like to step outside. I like to walk my deck and pray and seek God and study this word. But this time around this week, I wasn't able to be on my deck and study this word because of somebody's mama. Well, about a week ago, I, I noticed there was a nest under the deck because I stepped out on the deck. And the moment I stepped out on the deck, this mama robin swooped up over the deck and came around and started hovering around me. And then she'd go land in the tree and then she'd come flying right back at me and go away. I was like, what's going on right here? Yes, I'm not exaggerating. To the point where mama was like, what's, what are you doing? Why are you, well, your body language on the deck. And I came back and I said, I said, I'm being attacked. And they all laughing at me. And I said, no, seriously, when I step out on the deck, She's swooping around. She's trying to get as close as she can. She does not want me anywhere around her nest. And then the other day, I had to mow the lawn. So I, had to, I had to cut the yard in the back. And it was very interesting how when I was cutting the lawn alongside at the bottom of the deck, it didn't bother her. Matter of fact, I even saw her little angry head peek out of the nest. And, and, and she was grilling me. But here I am with this loud lawnmower pushing up and down right beside the deck. He didn't face her at all. She gave me that look like don't come any closer. But she, she didn't come out the nest. She ain't act crazy like she was when I was on the deck. And then last night, I tried it one more time. Like, I'm coming to the conclusion of this message. I, I need to land the plane when, 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 I, when I get the soul cry tomorrow. And I, I'd forgotten that mama was still nested under the deck. I came out. Immediately rolling. Telling you, she flew into the tree across from me. She came straight at me and then would like dip right before she poked me in my forehead. And now I'm looking at her like, what's wrong with you? Now I'm talking to the robin. I'm talking to somebody's mama. I'm talking. Stop it already. I'm like, your nest is under the deck. And she swooped back around and she comes and face me. Swoop, and I just well, forget about it. All right. And I go back inside. And didn't I say last night? I was like, what is that all about? Both of you shrugged your shoulders. Like. And then as we were worshiping, as we were worshiping today, as the Holy Spirit hovered over his people, the Lord gave me an understanding of what he wanted me to learn in that moment our God hovers over us and he protects us fiercely he doesn't care what's under us not worried about that but he will never allow anyone or anything to limit to 
to limit you from rising and experiencing his glory. It's a beautiful picture. This mother Robin could care less whether I was under. The problem is, is don't interrupt my flight. Don't interrupt the flight that I'm, that, I, that I'm cultivating in my nest. You see, that which is above belongs to me and my children. Do, do not limit God's people because God will swoop in and he will fight fiercely to protect you and to make sure no enemy, no demon, no devil in hell can prevent you from flying and rising up and experiencing the glory of God because God hovers over his nest. He will protect us from any footsteps that want to cross over the path that God has laid out for us. He hovers over us today. But like those babies in the nest, you and I have to trust God. I didn't see those babies. I never saw them peek their head out. I still don't know what's in that nest. I don't know how many she has. I don't know if they're still in their eggs or whatever. But I know one thing. They're not worried about me. And they had a mother that came flying out. She didn't matter how big I was. She made her presence known to protect her own. And your heavenly father will make his presence known to protect his own. Would you stand up with me? Our heavenly father is hovering over his people.